If we can help people understand how to stretch their limited food dollars and make their food last longer, decrease their food waste by better storing and and better utilizing the food that they do have, and by making healthy choices with that food dollar in the first place over some things that maybe are going to provide them less nutrition and, and less quality food to fuel their bodies, if we can help with that, then that is a big part of the solution. So that is why there is education components in many of the statewide programs, nutrition education programs that go along with some of those food programs. And that's why there's an education component with WIC. There's SNAP-Ed that goes along with what we formerly called the food stamp program. And FNEP is education about better utilizing and more carefully using those limited food resources. Most U.S. households have consistent, dependable access to enough food for active, healthy living. In other words, they are food secure. However, according to an analysis by USDA's Economic Research Service, some households experience food insecurity at times during the year, meaning their access to adequate food is limited by a lack of money and other resources. Kansas is one of the states considered to be the breadbasket of America, but many households still experience food insecurity. On today's Sound Living, improving food security. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. K-State Research and Extension Nutrition Specialist Sandy Proctor says a number of factors contribute to food insecurity. Sandy, recently a report came out that talked about food security across the nation done by USDA. And what we're finding is there is some improvements in some areas, but there is a lot of food insecurity across the country. That's right. It seems as though the expected rebound after the the recession is not as high or as across the board as we would hope it would have been. How does Kansas shape up in terms of food security? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And you think about Kansas is the the breadbasket of the United States and and kind of insulated by its mere position maybe from some of the issues that plague others with food access. But it really seems like though it may have come to Kansas later in the whole recession time, we know now that it's actually higher. Food insecurity is higher in Kansas at 13.3% of households as food insecure. And that's higher than the U.S. value of 12.3%. So we know that while it's gotten better in the past few years, particularly since 2013, it's been improving, that rebound is not as rapid or as complete as, as we had hoped. We should probably go back and actually define food insecurity. How are they defining this, I guess, on the federal level? Well, they say that food security means access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. So we're, we're not saying anything about the type of food. And in this, actually, they don't even mention the way of access. But we do we do have some definitions that say access to enough food in a societally acceptable way. And so, yes, I may have enough food, but if I have to dumpster dive or go around and, and check out grocery clearance racks, those types of things may not be socially acceptable. And so what we're talking about is the means to access enough food enough for a healthy, active lifestyle. And is this by week, by month, by year? How are they kind of breaking this out that sometimes you're food insecure, sometimes you're not? They do look at that. And it it is extremely up and down in many cases. And you can think about how that could be the case, whether it's seasonal or access can be really high or low, depending on, you know, if you have transportation available or if the harvest was good this year and, and you know, food is more plentiful and or that is on what you base your income. And so some of those things, it's very up and down. But the Economic Research Service has really worked hard to define what, what it looks like. And what they say is at least once in the past year, they have had insecurity of knowing where and when the adequate food supply would come from. So that's at least considered low food insecurity, so the the very bottom level. But it can be, you know, extremely very low where it's maybe a regular basis and it may be combined with hunger, which is a more immediate side effect. 
And am I right that this can, within a household, vary from adults to children? The adults may lack food security where the children have more food security? Well, yes, or it can actually be turned around, but that can very well be the case, and and that is thanks to some of our most effective security measures, safety nets in this country, which is what we've talked about a lot on this program, the, the summer feeding program and the school meal programs that are available, school lunch and school breakfast. That may mean that a, a child in the household um, gets a, a very good one meal a day or multiple meals, meals and snacks. The system is really set up now for much more than a single meal. But that child may be considered more food secure than the parents, but it is done by household rather than individual. How do some of the federal programs come into play here? Are they taken into account if someone is receiving federal assistance? Well, we know that food insecurity can still happen even with some of those programs, but those certainly help. Programs that are effective at reducing food insecurity that provide either cash or food assistance could include SNAP or what we used to call food stamps, WIC, Women, Infants, Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, the National School Lunch Program, local food banks. So a lot of those programs are in place to help prevent food insecurity. And in fact, here on campus, the Cat's Cupboard is a a newly organized and started about um, now about a year and a half ago effort to really decrease food insecurity here on campus. You mentioned Kansas State University, and it's based in Riley County. That is an area that surprisingly has a high level of food insecurity. That's right. In the most recent survey that we have, which was basically done with 2017 numbers, it shows Riley County as last in the state or 105th for food insecurity, individual households. And that when you think about it, is is pretty amazing. That means that Wyandotte and Crawford County, which in the southeast is a very continuously low income, very stressed part of the state economically. And then Geary County is 104th and Riley is 105th. I assume that the leaders in those areas then are maybe somewhat perplexed and looking for some answers. Well, you know, I think, I think, and I'm certainly no expert on reading the, the tea leaves that cause all this, but I think it is a really strong mix of some of the, the indicators and some of the very complex issues that surround this. And when you think about it, we know that Manhattan is a, a relatively high cost area. The gasoline is expensive here more than in other parts of the state. Food may be higher. We know that housing is high. And um, we also know that many of Manhattan's residents are students, and we know that due to other circumstances and internal to the university that the costs to be a, a Kansas State student have gone up. So there are a number of factors that have converged, in my estimation. Again, this is nothing official, but when you start thinking about those factors that could affect why someone might not be able to have enough food to live a healthy lifestyle, those things certainly would have to come into consideration. From an extension standpoint, what is extension doing or what can extension do to, we obviously can't supplement the income, but can we find some programs? Do we have some programs that will help people make those dollars go farther? Well, I think we've talked about before that nutrition education is one part of that. If we can help people understand how to stretch their limited food dollars and make their food last longer, decrease their food waste by better storing and and better utilizing the food that they do have, and by making healthy choices with that food dollar in the first place over some things that maybe are going to provide them less less nutrition and, and less quality food to fuel their bodies. If we can help with that, then that is a big part of the solution. So that is why there is education components in many of the statewide programs, nutrition education programs, that go along with some of those food programs. And that's why there's an education component with WIC. There's SNAP-Ed that goes along with what we formerly called the food stamp program. And FNEP is education about better utilizing and more carefully using those those limited food resources. And actually making them aware of the fact that these programs are out there because some people don't even know these programs exist to help. Well, that's exactly right. And then we have other people who feel like, oh, you know, yes, I, I may miss a meal every once in a while, but there are people who need it worse than me. And that's really, truly not the way the programs 
work their best. They work the best when people that need the program apply for the program, receive the benefits, and then put that money back into their local economy by purchasing groceries or by going to a farmer's market and actually using the money that they receive from those programs to put back into their local economy. And that's that's something that is another part of this is wages and jobs. And so all of those things go together to lift up an area's economy and their ability for people to have the food that they need. There has been an increase in gardening just around the country. Are we seeing that at the lower income levels as well? Or is that something that really they're not interested in? You know, we can't generalize, but we do know that community gardens are getting a real focus. And we've always had a real interest in schools, kids in schools doing gardens, but there hasn't always been a way to have just when a garden gets up and running, school is out. And so by having a combination school community garden that has year-round or at least growing season-round effort, some of those are really taking shape. And there's some very creative ideas across the nation to help people be able to access seasonal food, which is in many cases, most of the time, healthier and is also much easier to access. To go to a farmer's market may be a lot easier for some people than to make a, a trip to a grocery store that may be in the next county. And so all of these things together might make a slight dent in it, but it also has to do with policy at a level that is beyond the individual except with the power of the vote. And what I'm speaking about with that is Kansas has extremely high food sales tax compared to its neighbors. Our food sales tax is at 6.5%. Nebraska's is zero, Colorado's is zero, Oklahoma's 4.5%, and Missouri is 1.225%. So if you think of how much money our Kansas citizens are paying in sales tax that's not going toward actually filling their stomachs, it builds up a lot over time. And we also know that those border cities lose a lot of income to people driving over the state line to buy their groceries at a much lower price. And so this is something that there has been a real effort, concerted effort on by advocacy groups across the state to really work to see if it isn't possible to decrease the food sales tax in Kansas. There is a multitude of factors that come into play here when we're trying to really feed people who need to be fed. And it's really from the local, state, and national level. And it's going to take a lot of people to make this work. And it may be a problem that will never be fully solved, but hopefully we can keep making progress. I think you're absolutely right. And you mentioned local, state, and federal, but it's also at the individual level. And we are maybe most effective at that at that level for education, but it really goes beyond education into some of those policy systems and environmental changes that need to happen at the local or the state, even federal level. And like I said, some of those we affect through community action, but also through through voting and getting involved and really having our voices be heard that, you know, for example, it's not all right that Kansas families pay the second highest rate in the entire nation for their food. And so some of those things, once we're educated on it and we know about that, then there are conversations to be had. And if somebody wants information about the programs that are available, they can find a lot of that information by just contacting the Extension Office. That's right. They can find out what might be available in their area for different audiences and whatever they're interested in. Also, everything from healthful recipes that are going to have lower cost ingredients to even what websites um, might give them more information about this. For example, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, has a new bulletin that just came out in September on household food security in the United States in 2018. And so they can read a lot more about the subject um, right online with the information that's at their fingertips. That's K-State Research and Extension Nutrition Specialist Sandy Proctor. Again, for more information on food assistance programs, stretching food dollars, or reducing food waste, contact your local county or district extension office. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman, and this is the K-State Radio Network.